Hello, I'm James Mallory. I'm chairman of the Iredell County Board of Commissioners, and on behalf of the entire Board of Commissioners, uh, I'm here to give you an update on Friday, May the 1st, on the county's response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic and how we are fitting in the state's plan of uh, being able to deal with the uh, situation and protect the health of our citizens while at the same time reopening our economy so that we can achieve the right balance between lives and livelihood. Um, it's been two weeks since I gave you an update. Uh, just prior to giving an update uh, last week, uh, the governor had some rather uh, significant changes to announce and some new metrics and uh, ways to measure those metrics that uh, we needed some time to analyze. and. At this point in time, uh, we have 113 uh, positive COVID-19 uh, tested folks. Uh, we have, uh, out of that group, uh, some 39 are isolated at home. Uh, 64 have uh, uh, got run the course of the disease. We've got four that are currently hospitalized and we've had six deaths in the county. When you look at uh, Iredell County as we've divided it up geographically to see uh, what uh, uh, the uh, concentrations are of the uh, COVID uh, cases, it pretty well tracks along with our population density. In the southernmost uh, four zip codes, there are 65 cases to date. In the central zip codes uh, south of Interstate 40, there are six there are 35 cases, and north of Interstate 40, uh, there are 13 cases. The governor um, last Thursday announced that uh, he was going to initiate a three-phase process of reopening North Carolina. As part of that, he extended the stay-in-place order, which is Executive Order 121, by a week to May the 8th. After May the 8th, if the state met certain criteria, then they were hopeful to move into phase one, which he anticipates to last for two to three weeks, then phase two, uh, four to six weeks, and phase three beyond that, as long as it's required. The uh, phase one is really a continuation of uh, the stay at home order with uh, some slight easing up. Uh, the, so when we originally projected uh, when we might peak and when uh, we might be able to look at uh, lifting uh, stay at home orders from the state level, uh, we figured it would be uh, mid-May to late May and that's what it's turned out to be. I would note that all counties are under the governor's order. Uh, counties do not have the legal authority to uh, do anything less stringent than what the state order is, unless they are specifically accepted. Uh, so we're all in the same boat. We all are, however, different. And so one of the things that we've done is we've analyzed this data is to be able to uh, share with the governor and his staff and the DHHS personnel, uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, our insights as to how Iredell County has been meeting these new metrics and how we should proceed uh, ahead and our desire to proceed ahead uh, as a county, not just as part of uh, the overall state plan. Uh, and I'll go into that in some more detail. Phase one, uh, beginning May the 8th, we don't know all of the specifics on that. The governor has not released exactly what that looks like. Uh, but we're going to be concentrating really on going through the gates to phase two as quickly as possible and to try to do that at the county level. You know, the state is looking at all of the cases as a general population. And they're looking at trends, and those trends 
basically are based on four metrics. First is sustaining or decreasing the trajectory of COVID-like illnesses. Now that would include the flu, for instance. Anyone presenting with COVID-like symptoms, whether they're tested or not, and so over a 14-day period, they're looking for a stable or a declining rate. They're also looking for a sustained or declining rate of lab-confirmed cases over a 14-day period. They're looking for a sustained or declining rate of a percentage of positive tests that come back from those who are tested. And finally, they're looking for a sustained or decreasing trajectory in hospitalizations over a 14-day period. Now, when you look at the state writ large, uh, the results are mixed. They're seeing an increase uh, in uh, positive cases. In some cases, they've, they've had uh, weeks where uh, they've had an increase in uh, the COVID-like uh, symptoms. Uh, they've uh, had a, uh, a fairly stable a hospitalization uh, rate. So when you look at the state writ large versus Iredell County, you get a, a significantly different picture. And one reason is the state looks at the entire population as being in the general population. And what we know is that there are subsets of that population uh, that are in self-contained uh, situations, nursing homes, prisons, jails, group homes, any of those uh, type of activities are uh, basically in controlled or sealed environments. The highest proportion of vulnerable people, elderly people, are obviously in nursing homes. So when you have cases that break out in those particular uh, subgroups of the population, then the spread of the COVID-19 tends to be greater. And certainly in nursing homes, the severity and uh, the, the mortality rate increases because of the concentration of elderly people that have underlying medical conditions. So when you look at the total numbers in North Carolina, for instance, the total number of positive cases uh, are around 10,509 as of yesterday. Of that 10,500 cases, 3,035 are in congregate care facilities. That is all of those special uh, nursing homes, group homes, prisons, and jails. Now, when you're looking at one-third almost, about 28 percent of the state's cases come from a subpopulation of the general population that represents probably no more than two percent of all of North Carolinians, then if you're looking, if you're including those populations in the general population numbers, then you're skewing the results. You're really not getting a clear picture of what's going on in the general population, which is not in one of those facilities. So our suggestion to the state will be to uh, be able to look at them separately from the general population, because that's where you have your greatest risk of transmission, and you have the greatest vulnerabilities. And that's where the resources of the state should be primarily focused in terms of testing and treatment so that they can protect those vulnerable populations. There is some intersection between those populations and the general population, but they're limited. For instance, with nursing homes, the, the potential for transmission occurs when you have uh, folks that work as employees or contractors who come in to provide services or medical personnel that come in to uh, provide checkups that are not working in nursing homes or where you have new people being admitted to the nursing homes or people being discharged from the nursing homes 
or you have relatives visiting the nursing homes. That, those are the points of intersection between the general population and that very small subpopulation. That's where we need to focus on, like a laser beam, on ensuring that there is no transmission between the general population and those small populations for the protection of both. So if you factor that in, and I think that you'll see that North Carolina statistics will dramatically increase, partly because uh, the positive test criteria, when you have something happen in a nursing home, everyone gets tested. That's about a 100% testing rate as opposed to a much smaller percentage of testing in the general population. So if you're going to get more positive tests because you're doing more in a, that closed environment, you're clearly going to have a self-fulfilling prophecy of a higher rate of positive uh, testing. So we believe if you look at them separately and then manage the interaction between the two groups, then you will have much better results for the state. Now, even if you don't apply that, Iredell County has had only two cases associated with a congregant care facility. Uh, and uh, beyond those two cases, there has been no spread. That is a great news story. Uh, many of the counties that you see with extraordinarily high numbers have two or three nursing homes that have had, or a prison that has had a large number of people diagnosed with COVID. Um, and so our uh, hats off to our nursing homes and to our sheriff's department and to uh, all those group homes that manage very carefully these interactions between uh, people that interact from the general population with those special populations. Uh, Iredell County, therefore, really doesn't have those issues. And if you apply the criteria set out by the state, Iredell County uh, meets those criteria to be able to move through the gates of, into phase two. And so we're going to ask the state to allow us to do that as a county, regardless of how the state looks in terms of its overall numbers because as long as it's including the congregant care uh, special populations and the general population numbers they're going to have a difficult time meeting their own metrics so uh, besides that um, i will say this Iredell county nor any of the municip municipalities within Iredell county none of us adopted a stay-at-home order the state adopted an order that we fell under. We were looking at the request of the hospitals at potentially doing a stay-at-home order when the state went ahead and put one in and preempted that. So we do not have a pre-existing stay-at-home order for any of the jurisdictions within Iredell County. So when the state lifts restrictions, we don't have county restrictions that then uh, are in place. So we will have the maximum ability to be able to open businesses and respond uh, without having to uh, either amend or continue with any local stay-at-home orders. So there is no county in the state that has uh, a greater freedom of action than Iredell County. Many counties are just like us. They don't have, it's, it's all based on what the state tells us to do or not to do. Now, uh, what can we do to continue to uh, achieve the goals of uh, protecting lives, not overwhelming our hospitals, and to be able to uh, resume with uh, the normal level of economic activity so that people can uh, get back to work and provide for their families and employers can uh, open the doors fully. I will say this, even under the stay at home order uh, that identified a laundry list of companies uh, or businesses uh, based on their function that were deemed essential businesses, uh, one criteria, the very first criteria that defines an essential business is 
that you observe social distancing. If you can observe the social distancing criteria as a business, then you're deemed an essential business. So there are no businesses that cannot be in business in Iredell County with the exception of specific businesses that were prohibited under the governor's executive order 120, which limited or basically said you couldn't have gyms or other places where you have uh, close personal contact like barbers and beauticians and uh, tattoo parlors and uh, restaurants that had dine-in service or bars. Uh, all of those specific activities were closed in Executive Order 120. So what we don't know is when Phase 1 rolls into play or Phase 2, to what extent is Executive Order 120 going to be modified to allow those activities. And we're going to advocate <clears throat> for uh, being able to reopen our barber shops and our gyms and those other activities if they can show that they can appropriately protect their employees and their patrons and follow the social distancing criteria. Uh, the CDC is working to develop now specific guidelines for specific types of businesses and that's what businesses need to look to to come up with a business plan to be able to be prepared to open as soon as we get the green light to do that. And we will be advocating for you to be able to open at the earliest possible time that, uh, but it's dependent on you making sure you got the business plan in place. <clears throat> what can we do as individuals? Well, we need to continue to uh, practice social distancing. That's basically personal responsibility uh, to yourselves, to your neighbors, to your families, to, to limit the transmission of COVID through maintaining the six feet distance. If you're not masked, if you are masked, both parties can be closer than six feet because the, that's the purpose of having the masks on. Uh, if it's a surgical mask, it's just gonna protect other people from you. If it's a KN95, it's going to protect uh, you from other people. Uh, so uh, depending on the kind of masks that are available, uh, then uh, you need to exercise not only that personal responsibility, but personal choice. Everyone evaluates the degree of risk that they want to take on themselves. There are people based on their pre-existing conditions that are probably going to continue to shelter at home and not take risks. There's others that are gonna feel that they have the ability to get out and interact uh, more normally. Uh, but uh, you've got to achieve that balance between personal choice and personal responsibility. And so we've, we've been doing that in large measure because our numbers reflect it. You know, one way to compare how successful you've been is to look at your per capita uh, COVID diagnostics, and in that realm, if you look at all the counties around Mecklenburg County that are impacted, obviously, by the higher population densities, uh, the only county that has a lower um, case count per 100,000 is Lincoln County, which has a very small portion that's contiguous to Mecklenburg, and most of it is a very long county extending out to the west. So uh, we're in a good position, and it's because of your efforts. And so we're going to take that good position and advocate for uh, the ability for counties to be able, who meet these criteria, to be able to uh, uh, move forward as quickly as possible through these different phases. Um, as we go forward, uh, please just uh, focus on the facts. Don't believe everything you see on Facebook. Uh, don't believe everything you see that's tweeted or that's even presented, uh, you know, in a three-minute spot on the news. Uh, because uh, usually there's a backstory and additional facts uh, that uh, are needed to put 
whatever you've heard in context and to clarify uh, what the actual facts are. One final thing I'll say is this. Um, we have seen a significant drop. Oh, by the way, uh, our hospitals uh, are in good shape. Uh, the uh, goal that we had of not overwhelming our healthcare situation or healthcare capacity and in institutions uh, has been achieved. So our hospitals, I believe, will be uh, opening up uh, for elective procedures gradually uh, starting uh, this next week. Uh, mostly elective procedures which people go in and come out uh, the same day or not uh, hospitalized overnight for a recovery. Um, but our hospitals are very safe places to be. They are very focused on uh, protecting their employees and their patients. Uh, and to that end, we've seen a significant decrease in the number of 911 calls. We've also seen a significant decrease in the number of folks that are uh, visiting the emergency rooms. And why is that? Well, what's apparently been happening is a lot of people that ordinarily might be uh, experiencing some initial uh, indications of a heart attack or a heart problem or a stroke are not calling 911 they are sheltering in place because they are being, they've been more concerned about catching COVID by going to a hospital. Well, that's, I want to assure people, that's not going to happen. What's happening is with a smaller number of people calling 911 when they have these first indications of a, an acute issue, they're waiting longer until it's something they have to do. By the time they get into the hospital, the treatment program they could have gotten that would have had a much better result is uh, significantly reduced and they've put themselves at greater risk. What we don't need to do is to lose more people to death from heart attacks and strokes that are preventable. Uh, so please, if you're experiencing any kind of acute medical distress or concerns, do not hesitate to dial 911 and to go to the emergency room and to be checked out. So we'll give you another update next week, and uh, we will be publishing the letter we're sending to the governor uh, so that you're aware of what we're asking, which I've outlined in this uh, discussion today. Have a good day, and God bless.